You say uh, people should read 100 biographies. So, so uh, this is a piece of advice I got from Peter Daniels who said, in the course of your lifetime, read a thousand biographies. A thousand? Yeah. Wow, okay. B because in doing so, you will build a vast vocabulary for overcoming incredible odds. Um, every problem that has been encountered in life has already been encountered at least some variation of it by thousands of people, right? And, and, and when you read, when you study the lives of other people, it gives you an improved ability to contextualize your own experience. Um, whenever people fall prey to, to self-defeating fallacies, it's usually because of this underlying assumption that I am experiencing this for the first time in history, that I am fundamentally alone that I am the only one that kind of gets this problem, that I am the only one going through this sort of thing. And, and, and that is the beginning and end of defeat. But when you read, when you study the lives of other people, you develop a sense of, okay, this is actually normal. What I'm experiencing here isn't dramatic at all. And that's an important aspect of being successful, learning to not be too dramatic about yeah. your problems because you see how it connects you to the rest of humanity. I can tell you, when I started reading other people's biographies, the thing that becomes really clear, and Dale, Dale Carnegie talks about this when he tells the story of Abraham Lincoln, which yeah. is like failure after failure after failure after failure until he becomes president. Yeah. Uh, but when you read people's biographies, people have become wildly successful. You find a ton of failures. They run for political office and lose. There yeah. are Theodore Roosevelt's wife and mom die on yeah. the same day. Um, failures and adversity and tragedy amongst the greatest people. It really does help to read those biographies. Yeah, th there, there's a quote that I'm gonna get wrong, but I'll, but I'll, I'll convey the point well enough. Um, it, it says something along the lines of, if you tell me a truth, I will believe. You tell me a fact, I will know. But tell me a story and it will live in my heart forever. There's something about the power of story that helps us hang on to a truth, but to see our place in the truth. Truth can't just be conveyed propositionally. The imagination must be captured in order for the heart to be invested. And that's what stories, biographies can do. You are tuning in to another episode of Thunder and TK. Today's topic is going to be biographies that changed our lives. That clip you just watched was from the Matt Lewis show Shout out to Matt Lewis and the news. And during that segment, we were talking about this piece of advice I received about the power of reading or consuming whatever medium you prefer. Stories about people that you respect, people that you admire, or people that you can learn from. And one of the most popular questions that came up when I posted this on Instagram was what were some of your favorite biographies? What were the first ones you chose to read? What were the stories that impacted your life? And so Thunder and I thought that we, it would be a good idea to answer that question by sharing a few of the biographies that changed our lives. So today we'll go back and forth and we'll riff on some stories that we encountered, where we were in life at that time, maybe what we were going through, what's the context? And What's something that we admire about that person's life? What's something that we learn from it? So I'm excited about this conversation today. Dr. Thunder, how's it going, my brother? It's going well. You know, this is, uh, you know, usually we've we've uh, kind of talked about at least somewhat controversial topics. I think this is a nice change. Um, and uh, it has been several stories, you know, about people that I, uh, you know, people that I uh, admire and respect that have been uh, very much impactful and useful. Yeah, man. Well, I guess I'll kick it off, bro. I'll go first. I don't remember the first biography I ever read, but I grew up in Chicago and you know what that means. I can't bring up Chi-Town without bringing up my man, Michael Jordan. I grew up watching Michael Jordan. The Chicago Bulls were, ne were never really a famous organization like the Boston Celtics, the Los Angeles Lakers, the New York Yankees, the Boston Red Sox. The Bulls had no tradition of winning. And when Michael Jordan was drafted, it was the first time in Chicago history that we had a great basketball player who was exciting and arguably one of the best in the league. And 
there was just such an electric energy in Chicago that Michael Jordan brought, bought, brought. And I remember my mom buying me a copy of his biography called For the Love of the Game. I still remember that to this day. It had his picture on the cover and it was sort of like a, a picture book. And I read that book in one sitting. I could not put it down. Just peering into the mind of this icon from my hometown, this guy that symbolized for me success, work ethic, and so many other things. So I, I, was, I was in high school around this time, and I was actually trying to live out my own version of the Michael Jordan narrative. I was trying out for the basketball team every year and not making it and feeling so good about that because I thought, wow, I'm on the Jordan path trying out for the basketball team, getting <laughs> cut every year. So far, <laughs> so far, this is going well. <laughs> I got that part now. <laughs> Being told by my high school coach, I'm not good enough, except he was right. There will be no Hall of Fame speech where I'm calling him out. He was right. <laughs> I wasn't good <laughs> Hey man, but sometimes it's oh, a good thing to learn. You know, we we treat dreams as if it only matters if you win. But man, there is something um, humorous and humbling about going after some of the things you want or think you can do, and and just having reality be like, no, you're not doing this. No, <laughs> this is not your story, bro. You will learn something from it, but it ain't your story. Okay, so. One of the things I really loved about Michael Jordan's For the Love of the Game is there was a passage where he talked about when he first went to the NBA. He said he was really surprised to discover that so many basketball players do it for the money or they do it because it's easy. For people on the outside, there are certain fields like entertainment or sports where you just associate it with love. And you look at the people who work in those fields as they they do it for the love. They they enjoy their work. And Michael Jordan pointed out that that has nothing to do with the occupation. There are people in every occupation, including things that you might think are boring, who love it and who are lazy. And there are people in entertainment and sports who love it. And there are people who are lazy. Human beings are human beings no matter where you go. And we are not made by our jobs, but our jobs are made by us. And Jordan said he was so surprised that there were lots of guys who made big paychecks and they just never worked on their game. They never cared about being great. They never cared about actualizing their potential. They never even cared about competing to make the playoffs. It's like, hey, I've always been naturally better than everybody else at this. I'm good enough to be able to make a living playing this sport. And I'm totally happy making millions of dollars to show up every year and put up double doubles per game. That's a respectable statistic line. And I'll always be able to have a role on any team if I can put up 10 points and get 10 rebounds. So I'm just gonna build my career around doing that. And I don't need to become a 20 point player. I don't need to become a better defender, a better rebounder or a better three point shooter, or a better free throw shooter. And Jordan said he, he kind of knew right then and there that he would be able to create a lot of competitive advantages amongst his peers just by doing things that other people found too painful or too boring, too inconvenient. And he pointed out just how, mm -hmm. how far you can grow in life just by being willing to be the guy that shows up an hour earlier, being the guy that stays an hour later. It doesn't take genius. It doesn't take being the most gifted person. It just takes being willing to do little small things that other people aren't willing to inconvenience themselves for. I think that was the most important lesson I took away from that biography. And I try to apply that way of thinking in every area of my life. I, I try to focus on what it is I love, but then I look for opportunities within what I love to capitalize on things that everybody else might find boring or difficult to see what, what sort of creative advantages I can, I can make for myself. And to also isolate areas of my game where I think I'm weak and try to be really better. Like J Jordan talked about how he wanted to be a great defender. He found out in the NBA that it wasn't just about scoring points and a lot of great scorers weren't great defenders. And so he started to study great defenders. And every year he isolated parts of his game 
that he wanted to improve. And so I, I, I think that just applies to anything, not just basketball. And I would say that was the biggest lesson I took from that. Yeah. Um, since we're just about the same age, maybe with within a year or something of each other, of course, Jordan is tremendous, has been tremendously influential to me too. Um, mostly for those sort of discipline reasons, the sort of outworking everyone, uh, you know, he was, he, he was a, uh, legendary practice player, you know, like as, as great as he was in the big game, he was like that in practice and he was so driven you know, I read the biography "Driven from Within" um, on uh, on Michael Jordan, and that biography came out in about 2005. And I <clears throat> I read that book when you know I was going through some some tough stuff. Um, you know, I'm in my I'm in my second marriage. First marriage failed. And that book was a a book that was sort of, it kind of speaks to sort of dealing with adversity, uh, having that unrelenting drive to sort of see beyond your, your own limitations. And so for that reason, I think the story of Michael Jordan is, is so impactful. Um, I have a, uh, I'm starting a new series on my channel called leveling up with Dr. Thunder. And the very first video is going to be on discipline. I've actually already filmed it and I'm going to be doing some editing and I'll get that out. Those videos are going to be pretty short kind of bite-sized things, but the discipline thing, you know, one thing I say frequently is discipline is the great equalizer. And there are those that have been, have had as much natural ability as Michael Jordan, and maybe some that have had more, but none had the combination of the natural ability plus the just sheer work ethic, the discipline, the constantly working on his game. You know, he was a good free throw shooter when he got into the league. He was a great one when he finished. He was an okay shooter or below okay from three-point range. He was a great three-point shooter when he finished his career. Um, All of the things that he developed, he obviously had an unusual natural ability, but he was able to put that together with discipline in a way that we've not seen up until that point and and still haven't seen. I, I, I know no players ever to play the game that had that kind of drive. How many players did we hear about growing up who were hailed as being the next Michael Jordan? I mean, the list goes on and on. Jerry Stackhouse. J.R. Ryder. J.R. Ryder. Harold Miner. I mean, every year there was some high-flying shooting guard coming out of college who had the raw materials who seemed to be as good as Michael Jordan was at the time when he came into the NBA, in terms of athleticism, slam dunking ability, in terms of their jumping ability, in terms of their their mid-range game. But none of them had that mindset. None of them had that work ethic, that commitment to transforming themselves into something they were not through hard work. Jordan was the guy that taught me that that transformative power of hard work. It it almost feels like magic, man, how you can be so incompetent at something. You can be in moments where you feel so stupid. And then you practice and then you break things down into smaller steps and you work at it using a combination of repetition and 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 and, and analysis. And you can get to a point where there was something you looked at that was really intimidating to you and you go i got it now you know that 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 almost feels like magic when you go through it the first time and when i was reading that book i would go outside and i would try to practice different parts of my game 
I remember I wasn't a good dribbler and I would just spend a few hours every day dribbling with my left hand and I got really comfortable with it. I got really good at it. Now, my upside was just so low that I still was probably the worst guy out of all the guys trying out for the basketball team, but it didn't matter because I made the leap from doing something that I couldn't do to feeling really confident in my ability to do it. And once you discover that it's magic because you realize it can apply to anything and, and you stop thinking about life in terms of, am I gifted enough to do this? And you think about life in terms of, do I want this enough to be willing to put in the work? Yeah. You know, um, that sort of transformation that, you know, practicing can, uh, can deliver, uh, there's a movie about Charlie Parker called bird. And, uh, it was, uh, uh, produced, directed by Clint Eastwood, who's a jazz fan. Um, one criticism I have of that movie is that they spent too much time sort of, or now, so Charlie Parker's life was, was tragic. Um, you know, died in his mid thirties. Um, he totally changed music forever. It's impossible to comprehend the, the totality of his, uh, you know, of, of, of the effect of, of his, of his music. Uh, it's, it's hard, you know, they spent not, almost no time talking about how much practicing he did. Hmm. And <clears throat> so there's a scene earlier in the movie where, you know, he goes to a jam session and he's really not up to snuff. And, you know, the drummer throws the cymbal at him when he's playing because it's, because it's so sorry. And then it's like the next scene he's, um, you know, you know, he's the, he's, he's the baddest on the planet. And not only is he the baddest on the planet, he had totally recreated. He had totally changed everything. The only way that you can make that kind of transformation is from lots and lots of practicing. And this guy was practicing eight hours a day. He was totally possessed by the music. Um, unfortunately that becomes, has become overshadowed by, uh, sort of womanizing drug addiction and an early death that was self, totally self-inflicted. He had some powerful demons that he could not overcome, hmm. but his music is transcendent, you know, and coming right out of Charlie Parker uh, it's easy for me to transition into John Coltrane for a few reasons. Mm -hmm. Charlie Parker was born in, what was it? 1920 Coltrane was in 1926. And, uh, so Coltrane was a little bit younger. Um, Coltrane loved Charlie Parker when he was a kid. Coltrane started on clarinet and then he, uh, transitioned to alto saxophone and he sounded more like Charlie Parker than Charlie Parker. On, on alto, he continued to reinvent himself. He was using Charlie Parker's language to develop his own voice. So he, he changes from alto to tenor saxophone. And so in the early fifties, if you hear, you know, it's possible to hear some recordings where you swear up and down it's Dexter Gordon, but no, it's, it's John Coltrane. He had totally mastered all of the nuance of sounding like both of those artists. Now this made a lot of sense because there's a lot in common uh, from as far as uh, note choices, as far as uh, the kind of vocabulary between Charlie Parker and Dexter Gordon. Dexter played tenor. Of course, Charlie Parker played alto. When uh, Coltrane switched to tenor, it made a lot of sense because Dexter is a pretty direct transference of Charlie Parker to tenor. But that kind of edgy kind of sound 
that started with Dexter Gordon. If you listen to all the tenor players prior to that, um, it's kind of a more of a fluffy kind of sound, but Dexter had a much more edgy sound. So you can hear the influence on Coltrane's playing, even if it's just on, on the sound. But my point is, is about Coltrane is he continued to uh, reinvent himself. And over and over, he joins Miles's band. Um, he gets kicked out of Miles's band because he, he was hooked to drugs and he was not showing up on time. He gets kicked out. He signs a contract with Prestige Records. He records 16 CDs worth of material in two years. Also was playing with Thelonious Monk. He really changed his life over that period of time. So much practicing. Rejoins Miles' band at that point. And uh, probably my favorite period for Coltrane is the Atlantic period. Um, and this Atlantic period was like just before he kind of really got into the sort of avant-garde, the really outside, the free jazz kind of stuff. It's right before that. So it t sort of is, takes advantage of all of the sort of sheets of sound and bebop and hard bop, all of the influences, um, you know, and the modal playing that he, especially that he sort of pioneered during his time with Miles. Um, and but it also sort of is leaning towards that more sort of free. So he's playing like multiphonics and harmonics, you know, uh, false fingering. He's still, he's pioneering and changing what the, what it is to play the saxophone. There is a, there's a box set called the heavyweight champion. Um, and it's, it's all of the material that he recorded in the Atlantic when he was recording for Atlantic records. When you open the, the cover of the heavyweight champion, the box set, there is a dictionary definition of the word practice. And um, if, even the thought that, of course, this was, was released posth posthumously you know, after he passed away, but the thought that your memory is synonymous with the word practice is mm. profound. This dude practiced for 12 hours a day or more. He would go, he's practicing all day, goes to the gig, say it's a four hour gig. Everybody else is taking a break between in set breaks. He's practicing in the breaks. The gig is over. He practices. He goes home, practices all the way till he falls asleep, horns in his mouth, wakes up in the next morning and he does it again. This dude was relentless and you hear all these different periods in his playing and it's transformative. I'll tell you one of the most profound things that that's done for me is this idea that I'm not stuck with anything that I'm currently doing. I don't have to stay in any particular location. If I see something that I want to really go after, I know it's possible and it could be totally different from things that I'm known for or things that I'm comfortable with. I just, I don't feel, I don't feel like there's a block or a limitation. Coltrane did that for me. You can practice your way into anything, huh? That's right. I'm curious to know more about this practicing, bro. 12 hours a day. Wait, how where did that even come from? What did that even look like? Where did he pick that up? Now, you know, there's different thoughts about this. Um, he, he just had, had this, this drive and I think he found a way to channel some of the negative, negative sort of impulses he had that caused him to become hooked to drugs. He rechanneled those in a spiritual direction. And so there's this sort of asceticism that he's participating in, in this sort of practice as an offering of worship. Um, it's, it's like heavy stuff. Um, there are some, you know, there's the, the church of St. John Coltrane. <laughs> um, and there's a real church with that name there's a real church that with that name and and 
the adherents, they listen to Coltrane records. They, they play Coltrane tunes as part of the service. It's, um, it's seen, it's, it's said that he, he achieved, uh, something that's almost inhuman, uh, like impossible, you know, to achieve the level of depth of spirituality in his music. Uh, there's a recording in particular that I think people frequently cite. Uh, it's called A Love Supreme. And this is uh, recorded on Impulse Records. Uh, it's his classic quartet. Um, so uh, Jimmy Garrison on bass, McCoy Tyner on piano, uh, Tony Williams. Well, no, what am I saying? Elvin Jones, sorry, Elvin Jones on drums, and uh, and then of course himself. So it's classic quartet, and in the this piece is in four movements. Okay, hmm. and the movements, like for instance, one of the names of the movement is Psalm. So they have sort of church service, like liturgical naming, you know. Uh, as if they're de- trying to describe an aspect of a church service. Um, and the recording was dedicated to God. Okay, so that's that's the you know, it, it, but you listen to that recording and it's such a such a deep thing. I I had an opportunity. Uh, this was one of the last things I did before the pandemic hit. Um, and this was a uh, February, maybe the third week in February, 20, what is that? 2019. That's right. Cause 2020 was a total bust. No, no, no. It was a 2020. No, it must've been 2020. <laughs> it's, 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 it's hard to keep it, it, it straight now, but, um, February of 2020, I think it was like the third Sunday, uh, that month, uh, I performed with the with the jazz faculty from Ohio State. I performed uninterrupted the entire A Love Supreme Suite as part of the service in the church that I work at. Wow. Uh, it was about 20. But now, the, the recording is a little longer than what we did. I think we, we got it in in about 25, 26 minutes, try to uh, condense it a little bit. But uninterrupted the entire thing it's because the church is the natural habitat for that for that work so the whole practicing thing asceticism piece um uh you know the church of john saint john coltrane they'll go into you know jc john coltrane as in like jesus christ right so they go they go there there is this uh uh you know, he had, uh, like a lot of African Americans in that time, he had really, really bad teeth and like dentistry was not, um, you know, maybe not as accessible and affordable in those days. So he had really bad teeth. And so when he's doing these long practice sessions, you know, his chops are bleeding, his teeth are bleeding, you know, um, and so this is like the, so, you know, the blood sacrifice. Um, so, the, you know, so they get in really deep with this now, you know, I don't subscribe to a bunch of that stuff, but I, but I think it's interesting and it shows how transformative, uh, a, a sort of, uh, an impactful, the act of practicing can yeah. be, you know, and not the sort of Allen Iverson version, <laughs> although I, he's taken out of context. <laughs> yes, uh, you know, yes. it, with that, but it's not that it's not the sort of belittlement of practicing. It's the, it's the, it's the treatment of practice as if it is just as important as the performance it's on the same continuum. It's, it's part of the same thing, you know, w- one of the things that both my guy, Michael Jordan, your guys, uh, Charlie Parker and John Coltrane had in common is that, they were what people would call students of the game. For Jordan, that took the form of watching a lot of game tape. For Coltrane and Parker, that took the form of listening to a lot of music. When you talked about Coltrane, you said that he he emulated Parker's style in so many ways to where people thought they were listening to Parker. 
I think that is one of the most underestimated components of what we call genius. Because we only see people when they have worked hard enough to be in a spotlight. We only see people when they have become almost too competent to ignore, too competent to not show up and do their thing without commanding attention. That we assume, oh, this person popped out the womb acting like that, playing like that, talking like that, thinking like that, working like that, composing like that. And these are people who were immersed in study, whatever form that took for their field. They spent a lot of time listening to other people. I think that's an underestimated art, how being a student is such an essential component of mastering your craft, whatever that is finding the people that have done this before you and figuring out what was it that made them great and how can I integrate that aspect of what they do or some aspect of it into my own repertoire and being on a lifelong journey of that as well. To me, I think that's what all of these guys embody and, and they all ended up being better at retirement than they were when they first started out. They didn't just say, oh, I'm a star now. I got the record deal now. I got the NBA contract now. So I got the fame and I'm cool. The fame equals credit for what I do and I'm cool. I can coast. They all were striving for something that the fame and the money couldn't capture. They were striving for greatness. Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, I, I think that there is, this may, maybe seem strange, but I think that there is sort of a, um, a positive effect of the market of the free market in play here also. Right. So, um, the harder your work, the more you produce, um, you can somewhat be, be rewarded by the, by the market. Uh, Jordan definitely was rewarded by the market. Now we could argue that his contract was never what it should have been. I, I mean, I, I definitely would, would argue that. Um, but he also set the curve for, I mean, he set the standard for, uh, you know, uh, endorsement deals. You know, um, nobody was doing that prior to him. And he, I think he was making more money in endorsement deals than he was in his contract. And so uh, I think the market actually had a positive effect on that. Um, it created a situation where if you, if you work hard, if you really put all of this into this craft, into your craft, there's a market out there that's going to actually be able to support, you know, be able to support that and eventually will reward that. Um, you know, you know, as opposed to, I think, You know, I'm a tenured professor, and too often is the case that you see folks that achieve tenure that they sort of slow down. So you worked really hard to get up to that point, and then, okay, now I have job security. Now, what that security was supposed to be for is so that you could say things that are controversial. So you could th say things that are not convenient, things that are outside of the Overton window. Um, you know, uh, you could say things that were outgrowths of your research, um, uh, you know, that, that maybe show something different about the world that we never knew before, maybe something that's controversial without sort of the fear of losing your, your job. You know, that was the reason for it. But I think uh, it is the case also that uh, it's abused because folks will get that tenure and sometimes they will use that as a sort of excuse um, or as a reason to sort of lessen their intensity. Um, and uh, that doesn't seem like to be the, 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 the thing to do. That's not that's not the way that at least the way that I want to utilize that, you know, um, but the free market doesn't give you that opportunity to relax. 
you know, you, you, you got to still be on your game and you still have to be uh, inventive and you have to, you know, uh, you have to know what the newest stuff is happening, the newest technologies, the newest, you have to know what's going on. You can't just say, okay, well, I've been in the bubble for 30 years. I'm going to teach you the things that were the recent things 30 years ago. That's, uh, that's you know, that's not the, the way to go. Reminds me of this Milton Friedman quote I heard some time ago where he said, um, free market doesn't just mean you're free to succeed. It also means you're free to fail. <laughs> you know, that's right. you're, you're always accountable to the results. Let's, uh, let, let's talk about some other uh, great stories or biographies that changed our lives. So one of my favorites is Sidney Poitier, Measure of a Man. And Sidney Poitier is one of those guys I've always been a fan of. My fam my parents really liked his movies. I remember seeing um, Uptown Saturday Night when I was a kid. I remember seeing Lilies of the Field. And these were before my generation, but my parents really liked him. And he always struck me as the guy who paved the way for so many other Black actors because at his time, he played roles where it was controversial for a black man to even be in that movie. Now, if a black guy plays a police officer, that's just typical. But in Sidney Poitier's day, he would not only play a police officer, but he would play a police officer that was superior to a white police officer, things like that. He would talk back to white men or criticize white men in his roles or in, 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 you know, guess who's coming to dinner, things like that, the interracial marriage. He did so many things at that time that were groundbreaking and so many things we take for, for granted now, the way was paved by Sidney. But what I love so much about his story is that he discovered his passion for acting through serendipity. He came to the States with very little money in his pocket. He didn't know anything about theater. He lived on, on, on the roof of a building in New York, and he had no idea about winter time because he came from Barbados. And he, he didn't have any shoes. And he said when the winter came, that winter was a teacher. And he got a job as a dishwasher. He couldn't read very well, but there was a customer who would come in who really liked him. And his customer would kind of give him, give him some pointers on reading. And Sidney Poitier would go home and he would practice with a newspaper and try to develop his ability to read slowly but surely, just because he wanted to be able to improve his skills to have more opportunities. And so one day he saw in the newspaper, the classified section, there was a job actors wanted at a theater. And he thought to himself, that doesn't sound too hard. I probably can do that. And he goes over to the theater and it was a very respectable black theater with a very dignified um, director, creative director there. And he walks in and this towering figure says, um, where have you done acting? And Sidney Poitier didn't even know about theater well enough to tell a good lie. And so he thought the first place um, that he could think of was Florida, because he thought that might be a respectable place to say you had done some acting work. And he says, Florida, and he, he didn't realize how bad of a lie that was. And the guy just kind of gave him a weird look and was like, all right. He hands him a script and says, read this. Sidney Poitier tries to read it. He just stammers over the words, doesn't do a good job. And the, he was so bad, the guy snatched the script from his hand and told him, don't waste my time. Go be a dishwasher or something. And Sidney Poitier says, as he walked out of that theater, he was plagued by a question. How did he know? How did he know? Out of all the ways this guy could have insulted me, how did he know to use that word, a dishwasher? That's exactly what I am. How did he know? And he said he made up his mind by the time he walked just a few blocks that he was going to be an actor, if for no other reason than to show this man there's more to Sidney Poitier than being a dishwasher. And so he started to practice his reading every night so that he could be able to get through a script he bought himself a radio and he listened to the radio every night and would practice, you know, being able to articulate like the, the radio host that he would listen to. And he finally developed the chops to go back to that theater 
and he landed a role as an understudy. And even then he wasn't respected, but he landed a role as an understudy. And one of the actors on, on opening night, one of the actors got sick and Sidney Poitier was up and he was not prepared. He got on that stage and he butchered his lines. He did a horrible job. The audience was laughing out loud at his performance. And the next day he saw in the newspaper, uh, uh, the, the person who gave the review wanted to know who is this brilliant young man who brought such comedic timing and spontaneity to this play. And it, they talked about how refreshing it was to see Sidney Poitier on stage. And then he landed another role and another role and another role. And then eventually movie after movie after movie, he became the first black man to win an Academy Award for best actor in a leading role. And that's such a powerful story because it has a lot of the elements that we love that where you start in your journey doesn't dictate where you end, that your possibilities in life are not determined by the places you were born and the places you, were, you come from. You can be a nobody in a field and in your career being one of the greatest somebodies in the history of that field, that you can choose who you want to be in this world and you can work hard and achieve the seemingly impossible. But another component of that story I love is Sydney never experienced any of the stereotypes most of us have around finding your calling or finding your passion. He never at any point had a good reason to believe that he was created by God to act, you know? He just decided that he was gonna do that because that represented for him a challenge. It represented for him the thing that no one else thought he could do. And so it represented the possibility of defining yourself. And he chose the very thing that symbolized that for him. And I think that is a pretty effective way of, of going about self-discovery. That's a pretty effective way of figuring out things that you love. What are, what are the things in life, the challenges that represent for you the opportunity to define who you are? And there is a certain kind of magic that comes from moving in the direction of those things. That's, that's one of the things I took away from Sydney's story. Uh, yeah, you know, the Bible says it rains on the righteous and on the unrighteous. So... So pointing at the rain is is no excuse because <laughs> everyone experiences that. That can never be the reason why you didn't succeed. Um, you know, I this is a, a maybe a, a, uh, you were talking about him uh, uh, staying on a roof of a of a complex or something of a. What did he have? A contentious wife or something? Um, that's a, that's a Proverbs re uh, re reference, <laughs> you know, cause it's better to sleep on the, on the roof of your house than in the woman in, in, you know, yeah. than with a contentious woman. Okay. All right. Anyhow. Um, <laughs> you slept on that roof so, so basically, I, so basically I didn't hear nothing that you said the whole time you was talking because I was trying to hold on to that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, but I, I, di I did want to say, you know, a story that is, uh, you know, impactful to me, uh, is the story of my father mm. is of my dad, you know, and my dad, he grew up in the projects. Columbus. Uh, in fact, the way he tells the story, and I had to like really dig and make him tell me because he doesn't really like to share this stuff. Hmm. Um, but he grew up and it was a step down from the projects. He said when he, they moved to the projects, he thought that it was a palace. And, and you know, he didn't know his dad. Um, and he just, you know, if there ever was a story of pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps, that's the story. Uh, he didn't use any excuses. He didn't, uh, you know, use the, well, you know, uh, I, 
you know, I didn't see any way out other than crime, you know, other than participating in foolishness, you know, this pretty consistent thing that you hear, uh, you know, rappers and stuff, or uh, you, you hear him, them, them use those excuses. But the thing is, is that it rains on the righteous, on the unrighteous and on the unrighteous. So your response to the rain, that's an indication of who you really are. Hmm. You know, that's, that's testing your metal. What are you made of? And, and if you're going to use things as an excuse, which I think one of the greatest things my dad ever taught me was not to make excuses hmm. because that facilitates and has facilitated every positive thing in my life. The fact that even when someone said no, uh, that I wouldn't even use that as an excuse. I would find another way to work it out. That's stuff that I learned from him. And that's just from his story. But our lives, my, you know, his, all his kids' lives are, have been transformed, you know, have been uh, facilitated and transformed because he didn't make excuses and because he wanted to do something the right way. My parents are still married. They're married for 52 years. And that's, <laughs> and, and that's, a, that's a celebration. That's a story in itself because that's not yeah. what this, that's not the way that things work out these days. Um, but he wanted something better for his family. So he made all of the, you know, he, of course he made mistakes, but he persevered. And uh, I grew up in the country, horses, go-karts, four wheelers, you know, uh, you know, all kinds of stuff that he did not have because he stayed on that path and kept, kept working, kept working it out. Um, and was unrelenting, you know, that's, those are the kind of stories that I think we should spend more time focusing on stories like the story about Malcolm X. Um, if you want to talk a little bit, maybe about a Malcolm X biography, and then I'll make some comments on it. Of course, I have some of my own thoughts about him. Yeah. I, so that, that's another one that I encountered in high school and it was actually inspired by Spike Lee's movie. There are a lot of people you kind of get interested in after they make a movie about them. I had always heard about Malcolm X, you know, growing up. Malcolm X and Martin Luther King Jr. They're always kind of mentioned, you know, two sides of the same coin. And then Spike Lee started making a film about Malcolm X. I, I distinctly remember him running out of money in the middle of making it and then calling on a lot of leaders in, in black communities from like Oprah Winfrey, Michael Jordan, different people like that. And a lot of people came together to to support him financially to be able to finish making that movie. And at the end of his Malcolm X film, you actually see a list of the names that helped him. And um, he cast Denzel Washington as Malcolm X, who went on to, I believe Denzel won a Golden Globe for that performance. He was nominated for Best Actor, um, the Academy. He did not win, but um, he was nominated. I believe it might've been Al Pacino, Scent of a Rose that year, not sure. But uh, he gave a, a fantastic performance and it made me want to, go back and and read the book and and see what this man had to say about his own life and so alex haley had the autobiography of malcolm x and i remember reading that and there was just so much goodness in there i think the, i think spike lee's movie covered a lot it, it may have been like about four hours long and it's really good if you want the too long didn't read version but the book has even more things and malcolm is one of those guys who just went through a really hard life from you know, the the murder of his father, um, which which didn't even get acknowledged as a murder. It, it it was ruled by the insurance company as a suicide, even though he was placed on the train tracks and, and died in a way that clearly could not be explained by suicide. It was ruled by suicide. So his family did not get the insurance money to even be financially able to move on after his death. Uh, his mother ended up having uh, significant mental health issues 
and he was taken away from her at a very young age, um, condemned to a life on the streets, having to find whatever kind of legally dubious hustle he could in order to be able to make a living and ended up in jail, just like the stereotype that so many people get condemned to being. And Malcolm just has such a remarkable story about being in jail, l having lived a life that seemed like this was going to be the end. And he transformed himself through the pursuit of truth in that prison. And one of my favorite parts of his story was when one of the guys he met in prison, Brother Baines, begins to ask him a lot of questions and talk to him about a lot of things like personal identity. Do you know who you are? And have you ever thought about who you were in terms that are bigger than the name you inherited from your parents, in terms that are bigger than the jobs and roles that you've played in society? Have you really thought about who you were? Have you really thought about your history and how your history has shaped you? Have you ever considered the power of a book, the power of reading? And Malcolm, in one of the most powerful passages, talks about how he copied out the dictionary from cover to cover mm -hmm. because he was yeah. so hungry for knowledge. He was so hungry. He didn't want any truth, any insight to be concealed from him. And he represented the determination to overcome that old saying, if you want to hide something from a black man, just put it in a book. And copying out a dictionary from cover to cover is not at all the most efficient way to develop your vocabulary. There, there are much better ways to go about doing it. But the fact of the matter is, this is not a guy that had a bunch of online classes or a bunch of vocabulary building tools. He didn't have anybody to tell him the most efficient ways to do it. He just had a hunger for knowledge and he wanted to learn so badly, he came up with his, with his own method for improving his vocabulary and becoming literate. And although it was inefficient, it was his path. And it was so impressive that he came up with that and did that. And he didn't use as an excuse, well, I don't have a good enough number of teachers or I'm sure there's a better way to do it. It's unrealistic for me to copy out the dictionary. He said, nope, this is my situation. This is what I gotta do. I'm gonna take the time to exercise the determination. And for anybody that says, oh, well, he had the time to do it. Okay, well, explain to me why everybody who goes to jail doesn't do that. You know, um, yeah. there was something special about that brother's determination. And he transformed A good himself. idea today. A good idea today is better than a great idea tomorrow. Mm, I like that. Yeah. That's it, man. And, and we have so many opportunities to better ourselves. And by sitting around waiting for the perfect technique, oh, I'll get started in a year once someone comes out with the course that teaches it. I'll, I'll get started in two years once there's a new and improved technology that makes it easier for me to learn it remote. How about getting started right now in an imperfect way, in an inefficient way, because learning something is better than learning nothing in the name of waiting for the ideal opportunity to learn. You know, there's no replacement for repetition. Mm. You know, <laughs> there's <laughs> no replacement for repetition. And consider that. So what may seem like something inefficient was more efficient in some ways uh, than maybe better approaches right? Because it required more repetition, more time, more skin in the game, more sweat equity, more, you know, it's so anything that requires more has the possibility of giving you more, you know, because you're not just acquiring the information, you're developing character and perseverance and you're, you're, you're developing all of these things. You know, one of the things, for instance, that you're not born with is experience. And so you see, often as the case is you see, uh, like a lot of these little kids and these in these days, this is like, it's like a cliche. Um, there are so many like prodigy, super talented little kids. I mean, it's like, it's like at no time, it, in history. It's just like, 
it's just all over the place. Um, and, but the thing is, is that even if you have the natural ability and early training in order to cause you to be able to perform at a certain level, there still is no replacement for repetition and experience. So you may be able to execute at a high level, but you're probably not aware of what it is that you're actually doing. Not at the, not at the molecular level, you know, um, you know, the thing about Coltrane, this 12 hours of practicing a day. Now, I may argue that based on the way that your brain operates, it's not likely that you can get 12 hours of actual results, if you understand what I mean, in 12 hours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because you get to the point where you no longer can take in any more information. Mm -hmm. So I may be able to argue that maybe it was possible for him to accomplish what he did in three hours or in four hours or in five hours. Um, but the thing that he could not replicate without actually spending 12 hours is the time spent with the instrument. Hmm. So, no, <laughs> So whatever you want to say about efficiency, that's, that's all out the window. It's, it's time in, it's that extra intimacy and experience in pushing yourself beyond what is even realistic to see what happens on the other side of that. You don't gain any of that from trying to find the most efficient way. There's something, there's something about that. It makes me think of um, the Rocky movies. I remember Rocky Four, where they introduced that character. Uh, was it Draco, the Russian guy? A Dra a Drago. Drago, yeah. And they showed the two of those guys training. And Drago had all of this state-of-the-art equipment. Oh, yeah. And, you know, he he had the fancy gym, he had everything, and they showed him lifting the nice weights and the air conditioned environment and everything. And Rocky didn't have any of that. And they just showed this dude, you know, like, like basically working out on a farm. They showed him running. They showed him like lifting like real things that just needed to be lifted, you know, but, but he was working on his strength. And I remember there was something so romantic and so right about that image. It wasn't that there's something bad with having great equipment. It wasn't that there's something wrong with having state of the art facilities, but there is something wrong with believing that you think you need that stuff in order to be a great creator, in order to master your craft. And there is such a tendency to believe that if I don't have a big budget behind me, then I can't write my script. I can't compose my song. I can't be that great singer, great actor, great writer, great athlete that I want to be because I got to have the bells and whistles. And it's no greatness never starts with the bells and whistles. Greatness starts with the inner fire of determination and the bells and whistles when they come, if they come, they come as a response to that inner flame that you have chosen to ignite, even when none of those wonderful things are around. It reminds me of that timeless quote, I believe it was Muhammad Ali that said, champions are not made in the ring. They are only recognized there, but they're made in the empty gym. They're made in the darkness. When there is no crowd, right. when there is no audience, there is nothing to make it easy. And there's only them and their capacity to choose and say, I'm going to work with whatever it is I have to move myself in the direction of what I want to be great at. And to me, Everything you just said represents that, you know, don't wait for the state of the art equipment to be who you were born to be. Whatever God has put in you 
it does not need the permission of state of the art equipment in order to express itself. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> it's it's pretty limiting. Uh, it's it's not as powerful if it if it requires that. It, it doesn't need a cosign either. It doesn't need your family to co-sign it it doesn't need your friends to co-sign it it doesn't need need you know your colleagues to co-sign it just start doing it and you know and just spend the time you know it just it just reminds me of what is meant by worship you know you know this uh pursuance, you know, this intense pursuance. I can't think of anything else to call that than worship. I mean, that's, that's what it is. It's worship. It's, um, you know, I see, I see everything meaningful, everything worthy of putting that sort of effort into the process of perfecting it's worship I, I i can't i can't think of another thing that's more appropriate it really is worship um and like you know this sort of cliche that you hear in church um about you know Christianity is not just about what happens on Sunday. You know, it's not just about being there to be seen. Or even having uh, an experience. You could even have an ex a profound experience on Sunday. But that's not really what it's about. It's about what happens every day. Every yeah. hour. Every minute. It's It's expressed in the relationships that we have with people, with our friends and our enemies. <laughs> Facts. You yeah, know? man. I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Straight up, bro. You, you make me think too about like pray without ceasing. It's we, we really limit that if we, if our concept of prayer is make a petition every moment of the day. Like pray without ceasing does not mean always be in the middle of making a petition, always be in the middle of making a request. It's talking about a mode of being. It's talking about a state of consciousness. Right. It's talking about right. a way of life. It's physically impossible to pray without ceasing unless you internalize prayer as a mode of being. But that's another conversation, maybe a future one. We have time. Let, 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 let me say one thing. Let me say one thing about that. And then and then yeah. maybe we can end. Um, so pray without ceasing. So the monastic practice of reciting the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. To be able to, even though I'm having a conversation with you, for that to still be constant, constant, for that, so that is constantly happening. It's a mantra, but it's an automated mantra, conditioning oneself to have this automated mantra, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, sinner. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, sinner. As you're participating in any activity, doing anything, driving your car, whatever is going on, to constantly have that thing on replay and happening, that's what praying without ceasing is. Yeah, I've always thought That's of the Jesus Christ prayer. Is. Yeah, I've always thought of the Jesus Good. prayer as like a metronome for the soul. Uh, yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey man, I appreciate you taking the time to talk with me, man, about some about some people and their stories that have changed your life. Uh hopefully you all learned something listening to this or at least enjoyed listening to it. We always appreciate y'all tuning in. We always appreciate the support, the comments, everything. So don't hesitate to give us any feedback or let us know about future conversations you might be interested in. And please hit the like, please hit the subscribe buttons, please share this with a family member or friend that you think might enjoy the show. Please continue to support The Revolution of One, The Thunder and TK Show. And um, hey, continue to live out a story 
that will change the lives of others. Continue being the hero of your own journey. All right, everybody. Peace. Thanks, Brother Thunder. Dr. Thunder, not brother.